Open your books up to page 251, please. Mind you, do the hard book. If you don't have one, there's one right there for you. The uh, article was written by Bill Wilson in 1961. God as we understand him, the dilemma of no faith. There, before we uh, <coughs> before we get uh, any further, let's remember that this book, The Language of the Heart, is a collection of all of the writings of Bill Wilson for the grapevine from 1944 through 1969. And uh, it, it contains material that appears nowhere else in any publications. The only other place you could find this would be if you were to get back issues of the grapevine. Now this business of God as we understand him <clears throat> before we begin to read, remember where that comes from. We read in Bill's story that he was an agnostic. He was having great difficulty with this idea of God. His friend Abby said to him, Bill, it's only necessary that you adopt your own conception of God, whatever that might be. And that changed everything around for Bill because he wasn't being told or asked to accept somebody else's definition or conception of God he could choose his own and this is what turned the corner for him in addition his friend Abby said to him it's only necessary Bill that you be willing to believe that there just might be a power out there greater than yourself and it was that willingness which he said will be all you need to get started now as we go through the steps we see this, this phrase, God of our understanding, God as we understand God, and so on. And so Bill wrote this article to give us some idea of what that means. I think it's important for us to, to understand that a great man once said that if, you, if we hear something, we are interested. If we see it, we believe it. If we experience it, we understand it. And so what we're really talking about here, the God of my understanding, is the God I have experienced. At first it may be some kind of a very hazy conception. But as we go along and we're working the steps and we continue to take leaps of faith, we will begin to experience God working in our lives. For most of us, the God of our understanding is the God we've experienced. We don't pretend to know God in the sense of being able to describe Him, uh, except in general terms as love, for example, or all power, all knowing. But our understanding of God really means the experiences that we've had with Him. If you ask me to describe the God of my understanding, I'm going to tell you about what's happened to me, how God has worked in my life, because that's the God I understand. And so we're talking about a very integral and very, very important part of our program of recovery, this question of God as I understand it. Let's see what the book says now, page 251. The phrase God as we understand him is perhaps the most important expression to be found in our whole AA vocabulary. Within the compass of these five significant words, there can be included every kind and degree of faith, and together with the positive assurance that each of us may choose his own. Scarcely less valuable to us are those supplemental expressions, a higher power, and a power greater than ourselves. For all who deny or seriously doubt a deity, these frame an open door over whose threshold the unbeliever can take his first easy step into a reality hitherto unknown to him, the realm of faith. So therefore we can see in that first paragraph that the title to this article is rounded out. To God as we understand him, the dilemma of no faith. Faith is obviously something which comes to most of us as a result of learning we can trust God. That is, as we experience God working in our lives, we come to trust Him. 
we come to believe him and we believe in him. Somebody tells us, if you do this, you'll get this result. Take this to God and it will and this is what'll happen. We decide to try it. We do it. And suddenly there it is. It works. And we say, Wow, holy cow, that works. And that's where it all begins. And each time we take that leap of faith and it works, our faith grows. In AA such breakthroughs are everyday events. They are all the most more unremarkable they are all the more remarkable when we reflect that a working faith had once seemed an impossibility of the first magnitude to perhaps half our present membership of 300,000. To all these doubters has come the great discovery that as soon as they could cast their main dependence upon a higher power, even upon their own AA groups, I wish he hadn't said that, they had turned that blind corner which had always kept the open highway from their view. From this time on, assuming they tried hard to practice the rest of the AA program with a relaxed and open mind, an ever-deepening and broadening face, a veritable gift had invariably put in its sometimes unexpected and often appearance. We much regret that these facts of AA life are not understood by the legion of alcoholics in the world around us. A number of them are bedeviled by the dire conviction that if ever they go near AA, they will be pressured to conform to some particular brand of faith or theology. They just don't realize that faith is never a necessity for AA membership. That sobriety can be achieved with an easily acceptable minimum of it, and that our concepts of higher power and God as we understand Him afford everyone a nearly unlimited choice of spiritual belief and action. How to transmit this good news is one of our most challenging problems in communication, for which there may be no fast or sweeping answer. Perhaps our public information services could begin to emphasize this all-important aspect of AA more heavily. And within our own ranks, we might well develop a more sympathetic awareness of the acute plight of those really isolated and desperate sufferers. In their aid, we can settle for no less than the best possible attitude and the most ingenious action that we can muster. We can also take a fresh look at the problem of no faith as it exists right on our own doorstep. Though 300,000 did recover in the last 25 years, maybe half a million more have walked into our midst then out again. No doubt some were too sick to make even a start. Others couldn't or wouldn't admit their alcoholism. Still others couldn't face up to their underlying personality defects. Numbers depart for still other reasons. Yet, we can't well content ourselves with the view that all these recovery failures were entirely the fault of the newcomers themselves. Perhaps a great many didn't receive the kind an amount of sponsorship they so sorely needed. We didn't communicate when we might have done so. So we AAs failed then. Perhaps more often than we think, we still make no contact in depth with those suffering the dilemma of no faith. We'll stop right there. And uh, this is the place in our meeting where we like to share with each other. Uh, I, I would think that most of us here have, to some degree or another, come to believe in and to trust a higher power. Uh, we've experienced the coming of faith, a faith that is our own experience. Maybe some of us have had a lot of difficulty with that, and it hasn't really tried, seemed to work yet. Maybe we're able to share with each other and help along those lines. I'd like you to keep in mind this, that there are a few people in AA who have formed what they call free thinkers groups, and most of them profess to be uh, at least seriously agnostic, but uh, most usually uh, uh, atheist. Atheism is very tough. position to hold, I would think, in, in light of in the face of every all the evidence around us that there's something going on. 
But nevertheless, there's something happening with them too. And it may be well for us to keep it in mind. You remember that in chapter 4, the big book tells us that we're going to find God deep down within ourselves. That that's where His Spirit will be found. And it was so with us, it says. And these folks are talking about having found their better self. And when I have a chance to talk with them, I try to compare that with what we find because as our big book says, if we get to the tenth step, we've, we've become God conscious. we found uh, the, we have a sense of God's Spirit flowing into us. We find God deep down inside ourselves, just as the big book says. Maybe their better self and our higher power is a recognition of exactly the same thing. And I'm not sure, but it might be something to contemplate. But almost all of us, very few exceptions, if we stick around and if we work the steps and we start taking leaps of faith one after another, we'll come to a place where we develop a high degree of faith and we have a well-developed concept of the God of our understanding, the God of our experience. That's the way it seems to me. Who would like to start the sharing now? This morning, I woke up and I've been reading the chapter a day and I decided I was going to read the chapter to the agnostic this morning. And I was going to change my opinion because I thought that this, this subject was particularly pertinent to that chapter. Bill talks a lot about organized religion. How we are, how who are we to doubt the existence of God when so many other people are kind of working in their lives? Um, he talks about finding God within yourself. You know, I've been having trouble lately because I, I quit my job a few weeks ago. I don't want to get into a whole lot of detail. It doesn't really matter, but I find myself in a particularly difficult place with fear and financial insecurity. Two things which have um, really held me back, I think, during all the time that I've been in. So far. And, um, what I found in that chapter um, this morning, and, and through the reading so far, is that, is that I'm really going to have to come to this understanding of God by myself. Um, I have a sponsor who I know has the God thing. Um, I don't necessarily have to want what he has, but I certainly want to be able to find a God which I can come to rely on, absolutely. And I think during the next couple of weeks, given the position I'm in, and I have a good opportunity to get that kind of experience, which is going to strengthen my faith. And um, I really did a lot of you know, prayer and meditation this morning. And my meditation was, was simple. It was, God, I am seeking you. you. You were there, but now you are here. And I kept saying that over and over and over to myself. And I found that I've been able to use it a couple of times during the day. I've also started to do some things which people have told me to do. I had these two significant opportunities this week to help other people. And I didn't want to do that, but I did because I knew that that's, that's God's will for me. And, um, I need to bring my, my actions into line with what I, what I know to be true inside myself in terms of you know, what, what God's will for me is. So I think this is a really good opportunity to read this. Yeah. I'll refer you to, uh, let's take a look at page 179 in Language of the Heart, please. Because Bill addresses this very same subject. And I think it, this is good material for us to study tonight. The, uh, in the middle of the page, the second paragraph, though my sobriety had come easy, this is page 179, though my sobriety had come easy, the growing up business hadn't. Both emotional and spiritual growth had always been mighty difficult for me. My quest to understand myself and better to know God and His design for me became a matter of great urgency. The clergy, I reflected, must represent the accumulated wisdom of the ages in matters moral and theological. So I began to make friends with them, this time to listen, not to argue. I can happily report that one of these clergymen has turned out to be the greatest friend, teacher, and advisor I ever expect to have. Through the years I have found in Father Ed Dowling much of the grace and understanding by which I can grow, if only a little at a time. 
by the way, from 1940 through 1960, Bill considered Father Ed to be his sponsor. And there's a book out called The Soul of Sponsorship, which is a collection of letters and memoranda back and forth between Bill Wilson and Father Ed. And it, a lot of it is uh, during the time that Bill was writing the 12 and 12. It gives us great insight into the serious problems that Bill was having at the time. He was suicidal. He was deeply depressed. He was uh, experimenting with LSD. He was flirting with the idea of being a, becoming a Catholic. And uh, we can see that much of the 12 and 12 was actually written and edited by Father Ed, not by Bill. So Father Ed, but Bill always gave Ed credit for having pulled him out of this depression and teaching him that it was his dependence on the fellowship and his place within the fellowship that was causing all of his problems. And later Bill wrote about this and said that every disturbance he had, great and small, at the root of it was some unhealthy dependency he allowed to develop. And it was his dependency on his position in the fellowship that had caused all of his difficulties. So Father Ed was, was of enormous importance. Now, Ed Dowling was not, a, not a, an alcoholic. He was a uh, Catholic priest in, uh, based in St. Louis. But he got a lot of the AA in St. Louis started. He was instrumental in doing that. That's why we have so much Catholicism in the 12 and 12. Things like uh, Seven Deadly Sins and the St. Francis Prayer and some of the other stuff that's in there. Some idea that of original sin and so much that uh, we don't find in the big book. And Father Ed was just doing what comes nat came naturally for him. He died in 1960. Bill says, He's the finest living example of spirituality I happen to know. He's often set my feet back on the path when otherwise I might have gone off on an indefinite dry bender. It's characteristic that he has never in all these years asked me to join his church. Well, that was true. Bill had the idea to become a Catholic. Ed wasn't trying to get him to it, but the Archbishop of New York turned Bill down finally. Said that you just aren't willing to go as far as you have to go to become a Catholic, so he had to give up the idea. Therefore, it is with the deepest feeling that I here cast up AA's debt to the clergy. Without their works for us, AA could never have been born. Nearly every principle that we use came from them. Well, not from the clergy exactly it came from ancient history because these these steps are spiritual principles that go back as far as as written record probably even before when everything was word of mouth their example their faith and their beliefs in some part we have appropriated and made our own almost literally we AAs owe them our lives our fortunes and such salvation as each of us has found surely this is an infinite debt I think Bill overstates the case there a little bit, but then maybe not. So, that's, a, that's enough for a digression, but one of the things we do in this little group is it's a free swinging type of discussion. And everybody is free to share when the Spirit moves them. And we don't put any time limits on anything, and you can double dip all you want. It doesn't matter. What we're trying to do is to make some sense of some of this stuff as we go along. Who's next now? Terry. My name is Terry. I'm an alcoholic. And uh, I have to share something that's kind of disturbing me. And I know it's a little self-centered, but Seems like nobody is talking about it, and it, it's really bothering me. But it comes something like uh, what's in here, and I'm just going to read this real quick. Perhaps a great many did receive a kind of amount of sponsorship that they solemnly needed. Um, 
I had a really great sponsor. And uh, now I don't have any. And he's gone. And I really, really miss him. And, you know, just, I needed to share that. Um, I can only share what I know, but I'm not going to share that because maybe I'm not, I don't know the truth. And if I don't know the truth, then maybe I shouldn't share it all. But uh, this man has helped so many people, and he has brought me to a greater knowledge in my faith. Now, I've been brought up as a Christian in Christian community. I went to a Bible college and got my degree that way. I went to a Christian program the last time I got saved because my sponsor, who wasn't my sponsor at the time, told me that's where he knew that God would want me to go. And he was right. And, uh, you know, uh, sometimes I have my faith is wavered because right now, as this gentleman, I'm unemployed. And God is taking care of me. I, I don't know why I'm not kicked out of the halfway house because I can't pay my rent. But I still have hope in me. And my hope is, is not stable. It's even stronger because I know that I got put out tonight that tonight I wouldn't be because my God has separated me, as you talk about so much, from the drug or drink. He's in the middle because I asked him in the morning. I meditate and I thank him at night. And I asked him to take that desire away. And he has. And all my, the rest of my life is so much falling apart. It's like I know that I'm doing the right thing. I'm doing exactly what you guys tell me. Go to me, share, pray in the morning, meditate. Uh, I, I even doubt it. Take meetings into a place. I've got a sponsee. Uh, I do everything. I call my sponsor. Well, I did. I did. I used to see him every day. But I know I'm doing everything, and my whole life is falling apart. But this one thing I know God, my God, has separated me from And my sponsor told me, he said, if that's all he has given you, then that's exactly what uh, you should have. Because the only responsibility to come to AA is not to get a girlfriend or a car or a child. It's to help you stop it. And to build me in my faith, uh, which he has done. But, you know, uh, I don't, yesterday I came in here and I was just hurt and I still am. And I just need to share that to get it out. So. Somebody just know, and I just I, I just thank God for people like you that that work the program. I can see I, I see people that the promises have come true. Some people I don't see it, but you know that's all right because I know that every day I wake up and I get to take a drink that there is a God who's good who's good. Thank you, Terry. Who's next now? Huh? Yes. Mark. Hey, Mark. Um, I know me personally, you know, the thing that I want out of AA and working steps is to, uh, to have a very spiritual life. I know that uh, in the past, you know, when I've, uh, I've done a lot of praying and I've sought uh, God, and uh, usually when things happen in my life that I consider them to be uh, something going wrong at the time, 
I, I would continue to pray to God and ask Him for the answer on what is, what is the true meaning of this? Why is this happening in my life? And He has always answered my prayer. Um, the thing is, if I got what I wanted in my life, I would be totally miserable. Uh, in my mind, if I got everything that I wanted, I would truly be a miserable person. The things that I've gotten are the things that exactly what I needed. And they've all, all been blessings. A lot of them, have, a lot of it has been very painful, and I don't like pain. That's one of the reasons I reached out on drugs, is to uh, not feel pain, emotional pain, physical pain. But, uh, but I've always grown spiritually through the pain. And uh, I have always found that I got exactly what I needed when I needed it. And, and you know, today I've been, lately I've been trying to get out of myself and want it for myself. And I'm trying, I've been praying for, to do God's bidding. You know, may I help to do His bidding. And, uh, and He continues to put people in my life that, uh, that need help. And at the same time, it gets me out of myself and it keeps me occupied and it keeps me from being lonely and, uh, and it also teaches me the things that I need to learn at that time. But, you know, I'm, I'm amazed at the wonderful things that God does with me. It's true that He never ceases to amaze me. Thank you. I'm very glad I'm not an addict. Just to be here tonight. It's been a few years since I've been here. It's been a few years since I've been here. It's been a few years since I've been here.
big book says about the time between the fifth step and the sixth and seventh step? One hour. It means it too. Thanks very much, my friend. Who's next? Yeah. Jim, I'm calling. <coughs> the uh, faith thing is sometimes difficult for me, especially when, you know, looking at the third step saying, uh, God as we understand them because I don't understand them. I don't really have a clue when it comes to stuff like that. And it's been my experience throughout my whole life that uh, when hard things come and I continue to pray and I'm about to give up, I hang out one more day and the whole world opens up to me. I don't know how that, that works exactly. I was thinking about it a second ago, but maybe last two years ago I opened up a business and it was going very hard for me didn't have much money, the car was having problems, and uh, I was having a bad day. Everything went wrong that day, and I had prayed, and I, and I was periodically drinking at the time, and I said, God, just whatever you want to do, it's in your hands, and I just put it out there, and I've been thankful of the years that I did keep going to church, uh, and I just gave my day to God, and I said, it just can't get much worse, because you can have my day, and it's okay, whatever happens, happens, and uh, I went to the mailbox about 15 minutes later and there was a check in there for 5500 bucks from something that I had won and uh, they gave me the cash alternative and it was like as soon as I gave it up and I'm thinking, I started laughing myself, I could use one of those checks right now. <laughs> 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 but, uh, I just, I find for myself that if, um, if I go for a walk and I just look at the sky or the ocean, I get away from all the insanity and my student loans and, and the eviction notice and all these things <coughs> that, that have come up and uh, just since I've been recently sober and uh, once I get away then it's okay. I get a feeling of peacefulness about myself but if I'm looking through the bills and I'm trying to 
there's not anything I can do about it right now. It, it does help me. And it actually, it takes a lot of work for me to actually get up off the couch and go for a walk. It does take a lot of work, but uh, I feel better. It doesn't make any of those problems go away, but I can deal with them. And, and talking with somebody in the program that has significant more time than myself and has been there. But as far as God as I understand them, I just I kind of just pray for the willingness and I pray to get closer to God because uh, I, want, I want to be away from all that fear. That's the biggest thing to me that I'd like to get out of sobriety, that the fear of people, the fear of economic insecurity, the, the fear of what the future will hold it up. Ten years ago, I had three and a half years of sobriety. I remember there was periods of serenity and things that I had in my life that were up. That people wanted of all ages, and I, you know, I was 21 or three and a half years of sobriety, and I stopped going to meetings, and uh, I went out. It was, I mean, I went to meetings a couple times a day for three and a half years. I stopped for a couple weeks, and I went out. It took me 10 years to get back, so I can relate to the problems of, uh, you know, with the sponsorship and finding somebody. Because myself, I want to find the old perfect sponsor and stuff, and I don't know what God's will is. And to, and things like that, but I'm just going to keep coming and keep listening. Thanks. Well, thanks. Who's next? Me. You're next. Hi, I'm Chris. Hey, Chris. I'm, Chris. I'm a alcoholic and addict. And I, I don't know if it was yesterday morning or this morning, but I, I read the statement in the morning when I get up. The, um, I mean, the daily breath. And um, it was either mm-hmm. yesterday or today. And it said that God said to Peter, Says, is that you out there on, on the water, Lord? Can I come out there too? And he says, yes, it's me. You need to come out. And it was talking about the faith that we have in God. And um, I want to get out of jail too this week. And when I was in jail, you know, I, I asked God, you know, what's just not working my way? I mean, anything, I, I've been in and out of these doors the past 20 years, many times. And, and it just wasn't working my way. And I guess when I went to jail, when I come, I just told God, you know,
But until I want to get, until I get, actually get to see my little boy again and hold him in my arms and ask him, you know, then I'm not really going to forgive myself for it. You know, I know that it was because I was drinking and drugs and that, that I wasn't there. But that, you know, that's something that I'm, I guess I talk to God with us. Not every day, but I know this stuff man, you know, there. But, you know, I know that I'm going to get there as soon as he lets me get there in his time. And like what you were saying about, God, if I got everything that I wanted, you know, it's not what I want. It's what I need to have and what God wants to have. Thanks for that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. You know, if you turn to page 241 in Lang's the Heart, this problem of uh, no faith and uh, no belief, uh, Bill addresses this in a very beautiful way. The uh, third paragraph is talking about somebody who. Uh, may have a, an idea that there's a creator but not any God certainly nothing no God personal to him well he can strenuously try meditation, prayer and guidance just an experiment he can address himself to whatever God he thinks there is or if he thinks there's none he can admit just for experimental purposes he might be wrong this is all important as soon as he's able to take this attitude, it means that he stopped playing God himself. His mind is open. Like any good scientist in his laboratory, a friend can assume a theory and pray to a higher power that may exist and may be willing to help and guide him. He keeps on experimenting, in this case praying, for a long time. Again, he tries to behave like the scientist, an experimenter who is never supposed to give up so long as there is a vestige of any chance of success. As he goes along with his process of prayer, he begins to add up the results. If he persists, he will almost surely find more serenity, more tolerance, less fear, and less anger. He will acquire quiet courage, the kind that doesn't strain him. You can look at so-called failure and success for what they really are. Problems and calamity will begin to mean instruction rather than destruction. He will feel freer and saner. The idea that he may have been hypnotizing himself by auto-suggestion will become laughable. His sense of purpose and the direction will increase. His tensions and anxieties will commence to fade. His physical health is likely to improve. Wonderful and unaccountable things will start to happen. Twisted relations in his family and on the outside will unaccountably improve. And notice that there's something here which goes something like this. Probably some of you have seen that cartoon. There's a stork, a great big bird with a big bill, and there's this little frog, and the stork is trying to eat the frog. He's got the frog's head in his mouth, and he's getting ready to swallow the frog. The frog has reached around, and he's choking the stork to death. And it says, don't ever give up. <laughs> and so that's the way we approach this business of finding faith. Don't ever give up. Keep praying. And eventually it will come. Who's next? I'm going to jump in the bridge. I'm going to reach the uncle down. I'm not a fool. 
doing a good job, you know, and that's God completely. Because it's not what I'm doing. It doesn't seem like I make a decision to do what I'm doing. And um, I'm just amazed at the relationships that I have today. And I have sponsors that I love. I love my sponsors, you know. And I never had that. I never wanted to talk to anybody or let you know what I was feeling like this is this is anyway. You know? And um, you know, I'm not so hard anymore. You know, I wanna develop relationships and I'm not so full of fear and anguish and I'm really grateful for it. And that's gonna be that. Doing all this stuff in my life, and one of the people in my life, and, and the school, and, and, and everything in my life, like, it's gotta be God. Because I don't do this. I get hot. You know, that's what I do. And um, I am I'm totally moved every time I walk into a meeting and listen to somebody staring, you know, regardless of what it was, I had a grasp of the man. And it just moves me, I just sit there and come. Wow, that is so awesome to That you stay here all the time. And I just feel like, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm grateful. I'm so grateful. Like tonight, like, ah, I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to come to a meeting, I didn't want to stay home, but I didn't sleep. Yeah, I'm going to a meeting. You know, and then, I don't know, some people with me just told me, you know, man, just get out and drive, go down here. Which is supposed to be. All right, so I get up, I get dressed, and sit here. You know, and now I'm like really grateful that I came, and it's just like, you know, this, 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 you know, wow. You know, I'm just thankful that you shared. Okay, thanks very much. Listen, uh, I want to thank all of you for a wonderful meeting, lots of great sharing. Let's pay the rent, and then we will uh, close the meeting. Got it, Marilyn? All right, let's close the meeting now. the unity of our fellowship. A moment of silence for those who are still suffering. And we'll say a large prayer together. Please remember, we don't say anything after we say amen. Thank you. Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day for being here. See you next week.